Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Leroy Martin at the Pentecostal Theological Seminary, here with a good friend of mine, Dr. Tony Ritchie. He also teaches here at the seminary. I teach Old Testament. He teaches theology. And we're so happy today to be able to talk to you about a couple of resources that we want to introduce to you. Uh, the discipleship is a serious uh, issue these days. It's not enough to become a Christian. We want to become Christ-like Christians. We want to be followers of Jesus. And as I heard Dr. Tony Ritchie preaching yesterday in chapel, it reminded me that discipleship is a lifelong process. It's not something that we uh, start and do in a week or two, but it goes our whole lives. Uh, I'm a little bit older than Brother Ritchie, and so I can say that as his, uh, <laughs> as his elder, <laughs> that I've learned that discipleship never stops. And Brother Ritchie has written two books. I'm just going to share with you, go ahead and share with you these, uh, these two books. The first is called The Essentials of Pentecostal Theology, An Eternal and Unchanging Lord, Powerfully Present and Active by the Holy Spirit. This is a wonderful resource for um, all of our uh, lay people and pastors and theologians. It's written for everybody, really. His uh, most recent book is this one right here, Saved, Delivered, and Healed. This focuses more on the theology of salvation, what theologians call soteriology. So I'm just going to interview Dr. Ritchie and ask him to tell us about these books and I'm going to, I'll, I will put a link to the um, places you can purchase these books uh, uh, down below the video, and, and uh, you'll be able to purchase these books. So, Dr. Ritchie, it's glad to have you, glad to have you with me today. Tell me, uh, what motivated you to write these books? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martin. It's a privilege to be here with my elder in the faith. <laughs> and to uh, share together regarding my work. Um, and yes, uh, I, I think about your words and what the Scripture says about Christ being formed in us. So we have a lifelong commitment to the way of salvation. Salvation, spirituality, discipleship, formation, uh, all the various terms we use uh, to refer to the ongoing walk in the faith indicate the journey of life. And it's interesting, there's a story, a testimony, uh, briefly, behind each of these uh, texts. Right. Uh, for example, uh, on essentials of Pentecostal theology, and I, I've had a little teasing about that subtitle. It's long, uh, but it's thorough and specific, and it also, <laughs> <laughs> it kind of points to what the book is about. Right. Jesus Christ uh, and the Holy Spirit it, at work in our lives today. Kind of what happened was there was a group in Germany that asked me to do an article for an encyclopedia uh, on uh, theology, global theology, and they had a series on Pentecostalism. And they, they invited me to uh, do a, a chapter on, and they gave me a title called uh, something like The Essential Features of Pentecostal Theology. Well, while I was working on that, I, I had this sort of sense of deja vu, if you will. I, I've, there, there's something familiar here, and, yet, and suddenly I realized I was working through my Pentecostal upbringing, that in trying to get down to the essence, the essentials of Pentecost uh, and Pentecostal faith and, and belief, I literally was... Uh, digging back into my own own classical Pentecostal roots. And so I felt like there was more uh, that uh, after I finished the article and it was published, I felt like I had uh, uh, sort of hit on something that I really felt led of the Lord to follow up on. So I went into uh, that um, project and ended up with this book, which attempts to get Right, you know, it, it's not a theology in the sense of dealing with the corpus or, or the, all the topics, and it's not a systematic in those ways. But what it does attempt to do is get to the essential core uh, matters of what it means to be a Pentecostal Christian today. All right, that's great. And what, one thing I love about your book is that it doesn't follow the traditional pattern of uh, theology. 
uh, there are other great books on on uh, theology following the traditional uh, outlining of systematic uh, theology, but that you you point out um, the characteristics particularly of Pentecostal theology, and you mention a few things normally not found in theology books, such as um, worship and prayer, uh, and then a pastoral paradigm, uh, guidelines for a pastoral approach, which is uh, not usually found. But uh, I thought it was interesting that you start out by talking about sanctification and uh, the controversies over sanctification and the controversies over uh, the Godhead, the Trinity. Uh, the book is divided, just to give you guys a, a, a kind of an overview here, the book is divided into three parts, beginning with accents and conflicts, where he talks about sanctification and then the Godhead. Part two is a description of, uh, of some important uh, essentials, the unchanging Christ, unchanging Christ, experiencing God's presence in worship, experiencing God's presence in prayer, biblical and classical framework, uh, full gospel theological and pastoral paradigm. Here the emphasis is on the full gospel. Part three then is crucial com commitments, the doctrine of subsequence, which would teach us about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then chapter 10, the purpose of spirit baptism. Then chapter 11, initial evidence of speaking in other tongues. And then the final chapter, significance of glossolalia, the significance of speaking in tongues. So why did you start out with controversies? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, mostly because that's our early history. Uh, after the uh, great impetus of early revival and outpouring that became a global phenomenon, uh, it, it was not very long, just a few years uh, before we started uh, as a movement uh, having some controversy. And Pentecostalism started out Wesleyan holiness and Trinitarian. That's our roots, uh, very much uh, a part of that tradition. Mm -hmm. And yet it wasn't long before uh, uh, the influx of non-Wesleyan holiness ministers and individuals challenged that beginning paradigm and so our early history is characterized by a debate over mm. how sanctification is experienced, received, its inception in the heart, if you will. Uh, not so much how it's lived out, but, but really the realities of it. And then there, there had long been, even before the classical Pentecostal revival, there had been this uh, 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 very strong Christocentric, emphasis in evangelical and conservative Christianity, which ultimately had or contributed to the, in, in its fruition uh, uh, those who went what we call oneness mm -hmm. uh, in, in theology. There are other uh, popular names for it. It's unorthodox in its Unitarian uh, belief concerning the doctrine of God, God's nature and being, the Godhead, as the book puts it, and as Dr. Martin mentioned it. So that's our background. That's, that sets the stage for much of what okay. that, that, that we, who we are. About three, uh, no, a little closer to four-fifths of Pentecostalism is Trinitarian. Um, and, uh, but then there's that one-fifth or 20, a little over 20% that is Unitarian. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that has to be kept in mind. Uh, uh, we, of course, are Trinitarian, Wesleyan holiness, uh, and that's the perspective. But I mm -hmm. felt like it was fair to deal with those realities in, in our history. And then again, on the other hand, uh, a, a large number of Pentecostal denominations and organizations have essentially gone Baptistic in their understanding of uh, sanctification, mm -hmm. a, a sort of a Reformed perspective. Mm -hmm which downplays what they consider radical elements of the Wesleyan holiness movement, which nevertheless I feel like is important, Dr. Martin, because that, that, that matrix out of which classical Pentecostalism was birthed, I think is important to nurturing its continuing identity and health. So right. I wanted to uh, bring those out. And I, I'm not so much trying to choose a side and pick a fight or anything, but I want us to be aware of that background so that we can move forward in um, in in our you know I think our truest identity right that's that's great 
So you have uh, five sections in your description, um, starting out with an unchanging Christ, and then worship, prayer, and full gospel paradigms. Um, so do you want to you want to re- make any remarks on how you chose those uh, topics? Absolutely. Or- or that order or whatever? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> just very briefly, uh, the really a theme uh, for this book, a scripture theme for me and when I'm writing and explicating as well as I can, mm-hmm. is Hebrews 13 and 8. Right. To, to me, I understand Pentecostalism to be a contemporary affirmation of the idea that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, so this is rooted in a Christology that nevertheless is applied uh, experientially in our lives and, and accomplished experientially in our lives uh, pneumatologically or pneumatically, in other words, by the Holy Spirit. So I wanted to root this in uh, the immutable nature of Jesus Christ and then show how that uh, uh, affects our theology and our spirituality. And, and you have already mentioned it, uh, Dr. Martin. But uh, I was very uh, uh, disappointed that most uh, uh, systematic theologies of one kind or another just don't deal with worship and prayer. Mm -hmm. And yet that's at the heart of spirituality and theology Mm -hmm. for Pentecostals. So I sought to explicate that some because it's so central uh, uh, to us. now, in that, I also wanted to include that fivefold gospel paradigm because it literally uh, uh, it doesn't exhaust Pentecostal theology, but it provides a wonderful heuristic uh, device for being able to interpret and understand that which is most distinctive mm-hmm. about Pentecostal theology. Right. In case somebody watching doesn't know exactly what you mean by that, what? What do you mean by full gospel? Yes, uh, I'm talking about the fivefold gospel that was referenced repeatedly in early Pentecostal mm-hmm. literature. Uh, Jesus is Savior, Sanctifier, Holy Spirit, Baptizer, Healer, and He is our soon coming King. Now, in the more Baptistic uh, versions of Pentecostal uh, uh, Christians today that I meant, mo- mentioned a moment ago, it is the case that uh, there they use a fourfold version of that full gospel concept because they collapse as it were, sanctification into conversion or salvation. Uh, and so you, you have them saying Jesus is Savior, uh, Jesus is Holy Spirit baptizer, Jesus is healer, and Jesus is soon coming king. And although that may seem at first like a subtle, maybe even minimal difference, it ends up making uh, a great deal of difference in our approach to faith and conduct in the Christian life. So by full gospel, I'm talking about the five-fold version. And that uh-huh. phrase has been used at various times throughout history uh-huh. when, not just by Pentecostals, but most um, uh, notably uh, uh, by Pentecostals now. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and But it has been used as a way of saying we're reclaiming something that has been minimized mm-hmm. or maybe even uh, just completely neglected. Yeah. And, of course, some of our beliefs about spirit baptism and divine healing and so on and so forth uh, fall into those categories. Right, right. Well, <clears throat> let's uh, take a look at uh, part three, which is um, essentially an entire section of four chapters regarding spirit baptism. Um I suppose those who are not Pentecostal would would sometimes say, "Well, don't don't we all have the Spirit? What what what's all this about Spirit baptism? Why is that important?" I think that is an important conversation to have. Uh, it is the case that all of us who believe in regeneration by the Spirit or the new birth do believe and understand that all Christians are indwelt, enlivened by the Holy Spirit. Uh, there, there really is no such thing, in my understanding, uh, as a Christian who doesn't have the 
the Spirit. And mm-hmm. Paul says as much in Romans yeah. Yeah. if we don't have the Spirit of Christ. However, Pentecostals believe biblically, theologically, and experientially that subsequent to our conversion, our new birth, there is this infilling, this baptism, kind of a parallel, contrasting parallel. Uh, with water baptism, just as we're immersed Mm -hmm. into water, we can be immersed in the Holy Spirit. And that's an empowering experience. Uh, It it is a gifting experience with charismatic dimensions and missiological or vocational uh, uh, themes. And we are empowered, according to Acts 1 and 8, as witnesses and servants to Jesus Christ in, in this time. And Pentecostals believe and appropriate uh, uh, the experience of spirit baptism uh, as uh, distinct and subsequent to uh, a conversion uh, in, in order to empower us. And so I see spirit baptism as really, uh, especially spirit baptism as accompanied by speaking in tongues uh, in a, uh, as with its sign value or is often said evidentiary value mm-hmm. as being really that which is most distinctive about Pentecostalism. So I devote one entire section of this book, part three, as Dr. Martin has said, to uh, explicating those themes. Uh, that's great. Looks like that you give about 50 pages altogether to this section on spirit baptism. Um, and that's a significant number of pages because two of these sections have to do with purpose and significance. So for those of you that are ministering to others and people are asking you, why do I need to be filled with the Spirit? Then uh, Dr. Ritchie has answered those questions right here. The purpose of Spirit baptism and the significance of speaking in, in tongues. So Uh, I want to encourage you to get this book. We're going to jump on right into this next book because uh, we want to just go ahead and do both books in this one podcast while we're in the midst of recording. Saved, Delivered, and Healed, Introducing a Pentecostal Theology of Salvation. As Mm -hmm. I said, what theologians call soteriology. This book has eight chapters which begins with your basic assumptions, basic ideas, the foundation, the place of grace, uh, a, a key element in, <clears throat> in our discussions of salvation. Then models, various models discussing different ways people understand salvation. Uh, soteriological ethos, salvation identity. Uh, then something about spiritual warfare, in salvation, uh, eschatology, the last days, salvation's eye on eternity, uh, then physical healing, and then spirit baptism, uh, which uh, both healing and spirit baptism are included here in this theology of salvation. So uh, let's just go back and and start at the beginning. Uh, what what motiv- motivated then this book? You already wrote the other one. Uh, uh, what motivated you to go deeper into the idea of salvation? And uh, I will uh, abbreviate this significantly. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, I grew up as a Christian. I was third generation Pentecostal. My, my father's a minister. I have several aunts and uncles that are involved in ministry, pastoring and evangelizing and various aspects of ministry. Uh, but even in spite of that, as, a, as an a, adult, I sort of became the stereotypical prodigal. Mm-hmm. I, I wandered away from the faith. And, and uh, like the prodigal son, I ended up in a mess. Mm. And also like the prodigal son, I eventually came to myself. Mm. I realized Unlike the prodigal son, when I came to myself and wanted to go home, I found out that I had lost my way. Mm. I, the, the whole idea of Christian salvation, of mm. what it really meant, how I could really be saved, had, 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 had uh, even though as a child I heard it all preached and taught and sung and was in churches and considered myself a Christian then, I, I, I couldn't find my way. What is really Christian salvation? Mm. I just couldn't find my way. 
uh, and it was overwhelming and, and, and uh, really uh, depressing uh, for me. Uh, there's a long story there that I won't go into. As I said, this is an abbreviated version. But the uh, Lord led me back to himself, and I eventually uh, a, a was able to experience a, an assurance of my salvation. Uh, now, that began a lifelong journey of trying to understand and explicate the unsearchable riches of Christ. Mm -hmm. This book comes out of that. Now, with more than 40 years as a believer, I still realize that, the, that salvation is the richest of words and terms and concepts. Uh, we sometimes look at it as that that's the basic. That's the, but it really forms the basis of everything. And so I wrote this book out of my own journey as a individual, as an individual, as a minister, and then a, a pastor and a professor to uh, just sort of uncover mm. uh, the depths uh, and the treasures of Christian salvation. So, uh, and it doesn't do it, I, I will tell everyone right up front, there, it, it doesn't uh, accomplish that completely or exhaustively. I am convinced that for eternity, we will still be rejoicing in the uh, mystery of salvation. But it does help someone who really wants to know what really is Christian salvation all about. Is mm -hmm. it just a matter of saying, oh, God, I'm sorry, and I'll do better? Mm -hmm. Is it just a matter of saying, oh, God, I've got religion now, I'll go to church? Is it just a matter of I won't do this and I will do that? Or you know, No, 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 no. It's so, so much more. Uh, what God has done in our lives. Mm. Uh, and uh, so that that's kind of the backstory. My personal journey started yeah. it. So uh, is this uh, is this a theological book written for scholars or pastors or lay people? Who's, who, who is your audience here in this book? Yes. <laughs> you knew that was coming, didn't you? I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, because of my own journey, uh, I... And the nature of my ministry, I wrote this book at the intersection of those audiences. There are times that there are a few technical terms uh, that are necessary to use to really get at what's in Scripture, what theology is saying, but I always translate those into everyday language. I wrote this book so that uh, a layperson or a pastor or uh, who uh, is thinking and praying and studious you know, uh, can uh, read it without feeling like they're overwhelmed with a with a a, a, a whole storehouse of technical jargon. Uh, I also, however, endeavored to push us to stretch ourselves so that even the theology student or professor can perhaps uh, find mm. fresh insights or uh, support for our understanding. So I, mm -hmm. I I write for that that uh, uh, I've had lay people read it already. It's not been out long, but I have lay people come back and tell me that uh, they 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 were they benefited from it as well as clergy and even scholars. So uh, I I it's new, so I'm going. I'm sure I can do better uh, with it, <laughs> but I am getting encouraging feedback that my attempt to communicate Great. with a broad audience. I didn't just write this for academics, and yeah. yet I feel like that an academic who reads it with an open mind can also benefit. That's great. That's great. I'm just curious, why, why did you decide to include spiritual warfare in a, a book on salvation? What does spiritual warfare have to do with salvation? Oh, <laughs> this, is, this is great, uh, Dr. Morton. Uh, see, uh, Many evangelicals, and we are evangelical as Pentecostals, but many evangelicals focus on conversion itself. Uh, and everything is sort of subsumed under that rubric. But the Christian life 
And and one thing I tried to do with this book, uh, the reason I wrote it, introducing a Pentecostal theology of salvation, is because Pentecostals go farther. We 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 start at the same place, but for us, when you experience conversion, when you experience new birth, when you're justified, when you're when you're adopted, when you're born again, you know all all those terms that we use when you're reconciled to God. That's not the ending. That's the mm-hmm. beginning. Right. And that includes a life of spiritual warfare that's part of living out salvation. So I, I probably this mm-hmm. is a good point for me to mention, Dr. Martin, that uh, salvation in this book and in our movement, I believe, is used in two ways. Sometimes we talk about salvation. What we really mean is conversion. Yeah. The initiation of salvation. Right. But salvation is also this journey, this via salutis, this way of salvation. Spiritual warfare comes into place as uh, opposition to the journey, struggles in the journey, Mm -hmm. and how we overcome that. So I I do believe that as Pentecostals, biblically, uh, consistent with our biblical understanding, that we tend to see spiritual warfare. Now, I'm not only talking about exorcisms. That has a place. There are those who need deliverance before they can really experience the liberty of Mm -hmm. But it's also the case that that a person can be saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Spirit and still encounter, you know, uh, opposition in their their journey and their faith that that has diabolical origins uh, or characteristics. So I included spiritual warfare because for for us as Pentecostals, and this is Mm -hmm. quite unique to us, you can find it in some of early patristic Christianity and here and there in medieval Christianity, but mostly this is a concept that's foreign to Protestant Christianity, uh, but it falls right in at the forefront with Pentecostals. Yeah. Uh, you, he may not have used this terminology, but uh, I think the writings of Martin Luther display a lot of concern over spiritual warfare. Have yeah, you, it, have you read much of his? Yes, yes. And part of what happens with uh, Martin Luther is uh, his own struggles with the uh, sense of God's uh, darkness and God's mm. alienation from him yeah. uh, uh, leads him into uh, that kind of theme. And in, even after his uh, uh, understanding, his, his, his brilliant understanding of justification and the assurance that came from that, he found that he was still in a life of struggle. Mm. Uh, that, and, and, and I think it's a good point, Dr. Martin, that many great Christian thinkers throughout the ages have hit on elements like that, but but the traditions which arose up out of that mm-hmm. have not been, yeah, uh, uh, have not taken that up. Right. You know, right. for example, Luther, yes, talked about what we would call spiritual warfare, right. but Lutheranism, not so much. Right. And so on. Right. Seems like a lot of the um, developing theologies out of uh, Luther, Calvin, and Wesley focused more on doctrinal issues rather than spiritual spirituality yes the elements of spirituality which are of course an outgrowth of doctrine yes yes and in early christianity this strict uh, uh dichotomy between doctrine and spirituality was non-existent exactly. that is a post-enlightenment development mm-hmm. yeah. that has tended to make theology all about cognitive activity intellectual activity whereas pentecostals without uh, losing that uh, experience, uh, as you've emphasized in much of your own work on the Psalms and elsewhere, that a- affective dimension uh, that is involved. And yes, uh, but much of Protestantism has become cognitive and intellectual, mm-hmm. uh, and the intuitive, the affective, the spiritual. But for Pentecostal, that's one reason I teach a course here at P- Pentecostal Theological Seminary on. Pentecostal spirituality and theology, Mm -hmm. not or, or not two different courses, but how they go together because for us, they do. Right. It's a, it's an integration of the whole person. That's exactly right. Knowing God, being a child of God and doing what God asked, the knowing and the being and the doing is essential. Head, heart, and hand all come together. Uh, would, do you want to add anything in conclusion about either one of these books? As we uh, close this up, and we'll just encourage everybody to get a copy and uh, pastors to teach this in your churches. Uh, I'm really, uh, really, truly excited about these books uh, because good, sound theology in 
language that everybody can understand is so important, so important today. And uh, with the internet, you can find any kind and every kind of theology. <laughs> Truly, if you start searching on the internet, you will find a thousand different perspectives. But I have confidence in Dr. Ritchie because of his Pentecostal faith, because of his pastoral background, because of his training, and because of his uh, passion for God, that, th that these two books will lead you um, uh, into uh, the, the depths of Pentecostal theology that will uh, support and help you as a believing Christian. They will encourage your spirituality, and your, they will deepen your relationship with God. Uh, any uh, other thoughts uh, do you want to add, Dr. Ritchie? Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, I, I would mention that the, the uh, chapter on divine healing mm -hmm. I think is important. You, you noticed earlier that I included that in soteriology. Uh, Pentecostals are sometimes accused of faith healing. It's not true. We believe faith is instrumental in experiencing healing, but our healing is rooted in our doctrine of the atonement our approach to divine healing, so it makes it soteriological. I think that makes a great difference, and you'll see how that mm -hmm. plays out in the chapter. And also, there's one chapter that in uh, the beginning of writing this book, I did not plan to uh, uh, write, but I became convinced in conversation with friends and colleagues that I should, and I did, and that is the last chapter on spirit baptism. Mm. Uh, and uh, it, some may find it surprising, maybe a, dis a little bit disconcerting, that I included a chapter on spirit baptism uh, in a book on salvation. Um, of course, I am not saying that if someone hasn't spoken in tongues or something that they're not a Christian, they're not saved. But how does spirit baptism relate to conversion? What is its place in relation and connection with this via salutis, this way of salvation? How do we relate it to water baptism, to conversion initiation? So, and how does, and this is where I, 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 I deepen and I think uh, uh, take up the theme that's in essentials about the purpose. How does empowerment uh, uh, fit in with the idea of uh, salvation and vocation? Mm -hmm. As, so I try to do that. I would like to say I appreciate so much your, your words of affirmation, encouragement. Um, uh, your scholarship has been such a blessing to me for so long, and our, our personal friendship and the ability and the opportunity to work together here at PTS. But I, I would say thank you, and I, I hope and pray that these books bless you uh, as they did me because in, in praying through them, and I pray through every page <laughs> in uh, researching them and studying and writing. You know, uh, it helped me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm hopeful that perhaps it can be a help to someone else. Amen. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ritchie. Once again, we want you to subscribe to the uh, podcast. We want you to buy these books, read them. <laughs> Don't just buy them, but read, read them. <laughs> and uh, we encourage you in the Lord today. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritchie. And may God continue to bless your research, writing, ministry, and uh, all of the thank aspects you. of of your work. Uh, and uh, we thank the Lord for Tony's wife Sue, who is uh, uh, right there with him and everything that he does. And so uh, may God bless you. Thank you, thank Amen. you, Doctor. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.